and kind words uh today's topic will be his story history taking and examination in neurology i really like the suggestion of the name of the topic as his story because most important in history taking is his story we have to listen to the patient story and then only we can formulate our diagnosis yeah first of all i would like to thank the white army special thanks to dr kishan rao who is doing his post graduation in super specialty cardiothoracic surgery course for giving me such an excellent opportunity to address students across the country what a lovely opportunity you have given me sir thanks a lot uh, the white army the uh, help others to help ourselves yeah as uh, my post graduate student already he said i am the medical author of the book focused neurology it is available online from all the leading uh, book sellers especially amazon i have my own youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts about 5850 subscribers i have uploaded uh, nearly 225 neurology videos so if you would like to have details of individual sub topic of any lecture you can go back to my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts to get details of individual sub topics of my lectures uh these are the various achievements and uh, yeah one of the achievement is dr cherian one of the leading cardiothoracic surgeons of the country he himself came down and felicitated me for my book focused neurology in my medical college gsl medical college rajmandri andhra pradesh and uh, these are the various uh, achievements i conducted a quiz also at a national level yeah coming to the topic history his story history taking and examination in neurology i feel this is a very very important topic as dr krishan rao sir was saying not only for post graduate students of general medicine pediatrics but also for mbbs students right from the first clinical year not only for medical but also paramedical the technicians nursing dentist physiotherapy and and uh, for almost everyone who are directly or indirectly concerned with medical uh, specialties uh, i am dr srinivas neurologist uh, from rajmandri andhra pradesh india i have my own youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts if you have any doubts query or you would like to connect to me you can always email to me sriklpm@gmail.com yeah his tree taking his story i don't think there can be a more apt word for history taking than saying his story his story his story his story becomes very very important in fact this was uh, realized way back a few uh, decades ago by dr sir william osler quote just listen to the patient he is telling you the diagnosis unquote sir william oster just listen to the patient he is telling you the diagnosis you will not break your head for your diagnosis just keep listening to the patient he is himself telling you the diagnosis all you need is patience and a logical analysis of his story listen to his story you are getting history and the diagnosis and as far as possible give the patient own words in the complaint yeah history taking is very important in all the specialties like surgery pediatrics gynec and other specialties ent ophthal general medicine but of all the specialty history taking becomes very very important in general medicine and internal medicine and of all the sub specialties of general medicine like cardiology respiratory gastrointestinal for neurology history taking his story becomes the cornerstone of medical diagnosis in fact there have been excellent neurophysicians of ester years who could diagnose pinpoint the lesion by just history taking with just history they could even clinch the diagnosis and even pinpoint the lesion where in the pons pons and where exactly in the pons that is the kind of clinical acumen uh, they've had hopefully it will continue in this generation despite these 
expensive investigations and sophisticated technology. So the history is the cornerstone of medical diagnosis, especially neurologic disorders. Amongst the neurologic disorders like headache, epilepsy, and sleep disorders. For these conditions, history is a diagnosis. There aren't many investigations to, to cleanse the diagnosis. It is a history. For sleep disorders, it is a history. How many hours you sleep, how many hours you don't get good sleep. Everything revolves around the history. Epilepsy, in fact, one of the commonly asked MCQ question in PG entrance exam. What is the most important part of the diagnosis of epilepsy? Is it EEG, CT, or MRI, or history taking? The answer is history taking. History taking is the cornerstone for the diagnosis of epilepsy, sleep disorders, and headache. Most of the headaches, 80% of the headaches are primary headaches. There is no cause. Only 20% of the times we have the cause for headache, what we call a second headache, which can be picked up by investigation. But otherwise, 80% there's no cause. It is by history taking, I'll be dwelling in, in length after a few minutes from now, whether it's a cluster headache, migraine, or tension type headache, you diagnose it by history, not by investigations or sophisticated technology. So I emphasize, I repeat, I emphasize, history is the cornerstone of medical diagnosis, especially neurologic disorders, amongst the neurologic disorders like headache, epilepsy, and sleep disorders. The neurologic history begins with demographic data, handedness, chief complaint, and presenting illness. Handedness, most of the persons are right-handed. And for right-handed person, 90% of the time, the speech centers are situated on the left side. Only 10% may have it on the right side. And for most of the left-handers, it is still the speech centers are situated on the left side. So why handedness becomes important to know the speech centers. So right-handed persons, more than 90%, it is the left hand, left, left side of the cortex where the speech centers are situated, what we call as dominant cortex. So dominant cortex is that cortex where the speech centers are situated. So more than 90% of the right hand, the speech centers are situated on the left side, what we call as dominant cortex. So the other cortex where the speech centers are not situated becomes the non-dominant cortex. And nature has beautifully assigned two important functions to two different sides of the cortex. The left side of the cortex, the dominant cortex is basically concerned with speech. The right side of the cortex, the non-dominant cortex is basically concerned with spatial orientation. How wonderfully nature and God has, has assigned two important different functions to the two different sides of the cortex. So speech is on the left side, what we call as a dominant cortex. So the neurologic history begins with demographic data, handedness, chief complaint and presenting illness. Yeah, most important is the temporal course of the illness. You should logically, clearly give the temporal sequence of the illness. When did it start in the first place? How it progressed? How it evolved? And how has it come to the present stage or situation? This is known as a temporal course of the illness. How it beautifully progressed. So. Taking history is an art. History taken as an art. You should try to get the history, the narration given by the patient as a wonderful story. When you listen to a wonderful story, when you see a wonderful picture, it, it is always in your mind that when there's a good sequence of events unfolding, it, it, be, it becomes imprinted. So the narration of the story and the way you analyze the sequence of the narrated story becomes very, very important. The art of history taking becomes, it becomes more and more easier as you start taking more and more history from different sex of people. So the temporal course of the illness is very important. It is important to determine the precise time of appearance and progression of the symptoms in a chronological order. The rapid onset of a neurologic complaint occurring within seconds or minutes. Person is already suddenly develops right-sided weakness. Person is already suddenly is not able to speak. Seconds or minutes, it usually indicates a vascular event, cerebrovascular accident, embolism, hemorrhage. I've seen people who, who just keep talking to you, they suddenly fall unconscious, suspect hemorrhage, cerebral hemorrhage, or suspect 
cardiac embolism vascular cause a sudden onset person is already till that particular moment suddenly develops a neurological deficit suspect of vascular event seizure they suddenly throw seizures or migraine these develop suddenly any person who develops a sudden onset of onset of a neurological deficit usually there are two possibilities one is vascular like cerebral hemorrhage or cardiac embolism it could be true uh, it could be a trauma affecting the brain causing causing hematoma second is demyelinative demyelinative disorders they also present suddenly multiple sclerosis gvs gulen bari syndrome why demyelinative disease is present suddenly because the myelinated nerves have got good myelin sheath and the impulse conducts in a very fast manner because impulse jumps from one node of ranvier to the other node of ranvier like this this is known as saltatory conduction so when the nerves have got good myelin sheath the impulse jumps from one node of the ranvier to the other node of ranvier known as saltatory conduction so impulse transmission and communication is very rapid the moment myelin sheath gets affected this fast transmission of impulse gets affected the saltatory conduction gets affected so impulse travels very slowly so they'll develop sudden neurological deficit within within minutes within hours you should always think a demyelinated disease person developing very very sudden within seconds think of vascular so person developing sudden onset of deficit usually vascular or demyelinative cause so rapid onset of a neurologic complaint vascular trauma abrupt onset suddenly person who was talking to you suddenly falls abrupt onset with variable degrees of recovery in fact one of the signature findings of vascular disorders is variable recovery vascular disorders can recover on their own when the hemorrhage gets absorbed even without treatment some patients may recover that is vascular disorder a degenerative disorder does not recover without even with treatment they don't recover much forget alone uh, giving uh, treatment without treatment so a vascular disorder sometimes recover on their own even without treatment classic example is cerebrovascular disorders stroke if you take the general average of the prognosis of stroke patients if 100% of stroke patients are taken 25% of stroke patients that is one fourth of the stroke patients recover on their own even without treatment so that is a signature finding of vascular disorders they can recover even without much treatment some of the vascular disorders so stroke patients if you take 100% stroke patients 25% recover on their own without any deficit at one end of the spectrum at the other end of the spectrum 25% of the patients die despite extensive treatment 25% of the patients die amongst the 50% remaining 25% will have moderate deficit and 25% are bed bound why i am taking all these statistics one you will know about the stroke patients the general prognosis second i would like to emphasize the point that vascular disorders one of the signature findings is the recovery variable recovery so abrupt onset with variable degrees of recovery vascular or traumatic sudden loss of function they the cerebrovascular disorders they usually have negative symptoms unlike seizures which have positive symptoms so sudden loss of function negative symptoms like they have weakness person was able to use the right upper limb right lower limb suddenly is not able to use the right upper limb right lower limb weakness a negative symptom he is able to appreciate the sensation still that part point of time suddenly is not able to appreciate numbness negative patient is able to speak suddenly not able to speak aphasia suggests cerebrovascular accident so negative symptoms like weakness numbness aphasia suggest cva and transient remission or regression indicates the process is more of ischemia than hemorrhage so cerebrovascular accident especially if you take mca territory there will be a lot of edema edema peaks around 2 to 3 days and then slowly the edema starts subsiding and patient starts recovering sometimes a small embolus gets dislodged transient ischemic attack amaurosis fugax uh, a loss of vision coming from above downwards like a curtain they recover because the embolus gets lysed so transient remission or regression indicates the process more of ischemic rather than hemorrhagic transient ischemic attack 
So this is about vascular and trauma. The other causes rapid onset of uh, neurologic complaint is seizures, positive symptoms. They'll have involuntary movements, the tonic-clonic movements. If it affects the motor cortex, if it affects the sensory cortex, there'll be tingling sensations. Sometimes in, in, in focal seizures, there'll be spread of seizures from one distal part to the proximal part. We call it Jacksonian march. So tingling sensations of sudden onset, we have to think of seizures. Migraine, still slower temporal march of symptoms of headache, nausea, vomiting, or visual disturbances. The scintillating scotomas, we think of migraine. Subacute onset, as I said, two important causes of sudden onset are vascular and inflammation or multiple sclerosis. So the demon disease can be very acute or slightly subacute. So the other causes of subacute onset of a neurologic complaint is infection, bacterial infections, pyogenic meningitis, slightly still longer time, slightly more subacute is tuberculosis infection. So progressive symptoms associated with altered manifestations of headache, neck stiffness, fever, altered sensorium, we have to think of infection. One important point I would like to clarify. Persons who have purely intracerebral disorders will not present with headache. I repeat, persons with purely cerebral disorders, they will not present with pain or headache because brain is insensitive to pain. You cut brain, there is no pain because there are no pain receptors in the brain. It is only the coverings of the brain, meninges and vascular structures of the meninges, which are pain sensitive. So person comes with a pain like headache, that means the coverings of the meninges are affected, like meningitis, infection of the meninges, or subarachnoid hemorrhage, where the blood has seeped into the subarachnoid space. So only when the meninges are infected, or chemically affected, that produces headache. So headache, fever, infection always causes fever, neck stiffness, altered sensorium, think of infection. Again, another important acute to subacute onset is inflammation, multiple sclerosis. As I said, demyelinative disease, the saltatory conduction gets affected. So the fast transmission of impulse gets affected. So they'll present with the sudden or subacute onset of neurological deficit. But if there is a history of relapsing and remitting symptoms involving different levels of nervous system, we have to think of multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a demyelinative disease of the central nervous system. guillain barre disease is a demyelinating disease of the peripheral nervous system. Both are demyelinating diseases, but multiple sclerosis affects the central nervous system. guillain barre syndrome affects the peripheral nervous system. Multiple sclerosis the characteristic lesion is demyelination. So the well-myelinated tracts get affected. The well-myelinated tracts are posterior column, pyramidal tract, optic nerves, and cerebellum. That's why multiple sclerosis, the symptoms are usually confined to optic nerve, cerebellum, posterior column, and pyramidal tract. Spinothalamic tract is generally not affected. It is spared because spinothalamic tract is least myelinated. So multiple sclerosis, a demyelinative disease affecting the affecting the myelinated tracts like posterior column, pyramidal tract, cerebellum, and optic nerves. And multiple sclerosis affects different parts of the brain at different time course. That's why relapsing and remitting. So it is disseminated in, in relationship to space. It is disseminated in relationship to time. Person gets an attack, that's better only to get the attack again. So it's a relapsing and remitting type. Relapsing and remitting time. Again, we have many types like progressive, secondary progressive. But basically, it is a relapsing and remitting type. It is disseminated in space. So cerebellum can get affected. Posterior column can get affected. Multiple areas can get affected. Spinal cord can get affected. And disseminated in time. They, they, they become better at one point of time and they only to get worse in the other time of at the other point of time. So relapsing and remitting symptoms involving different levels of nervous system is inflammation, multiple sclerosis. Neurodegenerative conditions are slowly progressive symptoms without remission are characteristic of neurodegenerative disorders and neoplasms. Alzheimer's dementia, Parkinson's disease, they are slowly progressive symptoms 
without remission they are characteristic of neurodegenerative diseases and neoplasm so the bottom line is that the temporal profile of the illness how it started when it started how it progresses becomes very very important right this is the temporal profile of the illness history of the present illness and then we have to go in detail about the presenting complaint history of presenting illness when we are talking in terms of neurology we talk about higher functions first always evaluate the patient in accordance with education and social status you are a doctor so your level of thinking or understanding is at a higher level you cannot expect the same kind of intelligence with a person who is not even gone to school so always evaluate the patient not in accordance with with, with your intelligence with your social status with your educational status i'm talking from about from the doctor's point of view you always have to evaluate the patient in accordance with the patient's education and social status attentiveness whether is talking logically or coherently speech how is his speech basically when we are talking about speech we try to look out at three important points his comprehension which is done by wernicke's area whether he is able to understand what i am talking to him if he is not able to understand in the first place that means wernicke's wernicke's area is affected he's got wernicke's aphasia second is whether he is able to repeat whatever i said so whenever i talk to a person for example i am talking to mr x y z when i say what is your name he tries to understand it goes through his auditory apparatus goes to the wernicke's area he tries to understand okay he is asked my name it goes from the wernicke's area through arcuate fasciculus to broca's area arcuate fasciculus is responsible for for repetition and broca's area is finally responsible for fluency so basically we ask for comprehension repetition and fluency if he is not able to comprehend that means his wernicke's area is affected if he is not able to repeat that means arcuate fasciculus is affected if he is not able to talk fluently that means his broca's area gets affected so if arcuate fasciculus gets affected repetition is affected example conduction aphasia but in conditions where the lesion is very far off from the arcuate fasciculus like transcortical motor aphasia or transcortical sensory aphasia where in the arcuate fasciculus is spared repetition is spared so one of the classic features of transcortical aphasia is repetition sparing aphasia so if repetition is affected arcuate fasciculus is affected is conduction aphasia if comprehension is affected wernicke's area is affected it is it is wernicke's aphasia if fluency is affected person is not able to speak fluently but is able to understand it is broca's aphasia and we talk about memory with recollection of events immediate memory recent memory and long term memory motor system so when a person comes with weak nerve you would like to find out whether the proximal muscles or the distal muscles are involved because the corticospinal tract has got a proclivity for distal muscles so if a person's distal muscles are more affected than proximal muscles it is either a neuropathy or a corticospinal tract lesion corticospinal tract has got a proclivity has got a preference for certain muscle groups like distal muscles and it has got proximity uh, for the supinator supinator gets weak in the upper limb the dorsiflexus the dorsiflexus the dorsiflexus the knee flexors hip flexors get affected in the lower limb the wrist flexors and the finger wrist extensors and finger extensors get affected in the upper limb so when the supinator gets affected in the corticospinal tract they'll have the characteristic pronator drift so the pronator easily overtakes it and the person will have pronator drift so if certain corticospinal tract muscles like in the upper limb certain groups of muscle especially supinator and the lower limb if they get affected it's a corticospinal tract lesion so distal muscles get preferentially affected in the corticospinal tract lesions whereas proximal muscles get affected in in myopathy like combing the hair you should ask the history of combing the hair if the combing the hair is affected that means it's a proximal muscles and the buttoning the button get affected it's a distal muscles history of present illness sensory system touch what history will you ask to understand whether the person's touch sensation is intact or not whether the person is able to appreciate one's own clothes if the person we ask a history are you able to appreciate your own clothes if he is able to appreciate one's own clothes that means it is touch pain producing injury spin prick if he is able to if he is able to perceive it that means pain sensations are intact position joint sense falls when i closes during face wash when do we close our eyes normally other than sleep when we close our eyes 
when a threatening impulse comes to arise, we immediately close it. This is known as menace reflex. So when you splash water, you immediately close our, our eyes so as to not to affect our eyes. It's a protective reflex known as menace reflex. For balance, three systems are required. Minimum two systems are required for balance. What are the three systems? One is the ocular. Second is the vestibular cerebellar. Third is posterior column. If the three systems are functioning well, your balance is intact. <clears throat> but even if two function systems are functioning well, you can still have good balance. But if more than two systems gets affected, you lose balance. That's why when I'm talking to you and all the three systems are intact, I can still, I have a very good balance. But if the posterior column is affected and on top of it, I close my eyes when I splash water, two systems are affected, I, ha I have a tendency to fall. So this is known as a Romberg sign when we test it clinically. So it indicates that the post posterior column is affected. When the eyes gets closed, it gets worsened. So that we test for position joints and posterior column carries position joint and vibration sense. Temperature, when it takes hot water, whether it's able to appreciate the hot water or not, that is the temperature sense. For autonomic nervous system, we ask especially, does he feel giddy when he gets up from lying to standing position? When we lie down, the blood flow to the brain is good. But when we stand up, the blood has to be pumped to the brain against the gravity. So unless the autonomic nervous system is intact, blood flow to the brain will be inadequate if the autonomic nervous system is not functioning well. So normally when we get up from lying to standing position, we don't have giddiness or we don't have tendency to fall. Persons with autonomic nervous system, where the where when he gets a very when he gets giddiness, that means autonomic nervous system is affected. We can check it out objectively by postural hypotension. Check the BP on supine, check the BP on standing up and see the difference. If the systolic BP is more than 20 and diastolic BP more than 10, that indicates postural hypotension. And generally when we get up, uh, body tries to compensate by tachycardia, pulse. So you have to see the changes of pulse rate to postural changes, blood pressure changes to postural changes. If these are uh, functioning well, that means the autonomic nervous system is intact. But the moment the person says he feels giddy when he gets up from lying to standing position, that means person's autonomic nervous system is affected. Person may have diarrhea or constipation. In males, especially, we need to ask about erectile dysfunction, especially loss of early morning spontaneous erections is one of the early signs of autonomic neuropathy, especially diabetic neuropathy. Right. Past uh, medical history becomes again very, very important. Because one of the most common disorders which is kept in your clinical exam or which we encounter in day-to-day -day practice is cerebrovascular accident, strokes, brain attack. We should always ask history about diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking, alcoholism, because these are the risk factors for atherosclerosis, narrowing of the vessels and decreased blood flow to the brain. So always we need to ask about diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia for cerebrovascular accident. For cerebral abscess, we need to ask about valvular heart disease, infective endocarditis. For persons who are having history suggestive of cerebral hemorrhage, we should ask about history of bleeding tendencies and clotting disorders. If it is a bleeding disorder, that means platelet abnormalities, there will be bleeding from the mucosal surfaces, like bleeding from the nose, epistaxis, bleeding from the gums, bleeding per rectum, bleeding per vagina. But if it's a clotting disorder because of clotting factors, there will be bleeding into the muscles and joints, hemarthrosis or hematoma of the muscles, example, hemophilia. So we need to ask the per pertinent history. A person who's having acquired immunodeficiency syndrome may have lymphoma or toxoplasmosis. Malignancy can cause metastasis or paraneoplastic neurologic disorders, especially bronchogenic carcinoma can cause a lot of uh, paraneoplastic neurologic disorders, especially cerebellum gets involved. Endocrinopathies, especially dysthyroid states, hypothyroidism can cause carpal tunnel syndrome, can cause peripheral neuropathy. Trauma, it can cause subdural hematoma or extradural hematoma. If there's a trauma and affects the artery, middle meningeal artery, there will be torrential bleed, which is known as extradural hematoma. Whereas if it's a trivial injury, especially in old persons, a venous leak will be there. Blood slowly starts accumulating and goes from the frontal cortex till the occipital cortex because it is under the dura, which is known as a subdural hematoma. One of the common treatable cause of dementia is the chronic subdural hematoma. So you need to ask a history of trauma, history of gastric surgery, vitamin B12 deficiency. So these are all important history we should ask about the past medical history. All these nine important causes.
Diary illness, a person may be presenting with Guillain-Barre syndrome. You should ask about the history of diary illness because Campylobacter jejuni is one of the important predisposing uh, causes for Guillain-Barre syndrome. The person has got neuralgic amyotrophy, pain in the shoulder, going, going down the upper limb. It could be because of post-immunization, neuralgic amyotrophy. History, a person may be presenting with spinal cord disorders. It does not mean it's a spinal cord disorder only. You may be having a past history of visual loss. You correlate it. It could be multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, NMO spectrum disorder. So past history becomes very important. If you think it's only spinal cord presentation, you don't go to the past history of visual loss. You're, you're missing neuromyelitis optica spectrum disease. You'll be thinking only of the local spinal cord disorders. Personal history, smoking and alcoholism becomes very, very important because they're risk factors for atherosclerosis. Menstruation in women is important. One, it is catamenial epilepsy can be frustrated when, when, when women are menstruating or headache. But very important in terms of cerebrovascular action is why cerebrovascular actions are more common in men as compared to the women of menstruating age. Because women of menstruating age group, they have an increased high density lipoproteins. A higher level of high density lipoproteins protects them from the development of atherosclerosis. But once women attain menopause, they soon catch up with their male counterparts. The disease slowly becomes equal as they become older and older. So only this protection is only in the menstruating age group because they have a higher level of high density lipoproteins which, are, which, which protect them from the development of atherosclerosis. Therefore, any disorder which is related to atherosclerosis or vascular disorder like stroke, brain attack or heart, heart attack they are more common in men as compared to women. Pregnancy. In women, always pregnancy also becomes a very important factor because during pregnancy, there is an increase in procoagulant factors which predisposes them to the development of arterial strokes. So in pregnancy, the stroke is more common, more commonly due to arterial. Whereas postpartum after delivery, there's a decrease in anticoagulant factors like protein C, protein S deficiency. This predisposes them to the development of venous stroke. Why am I stressing so? So why am I emphasizing these points? Because arterial stroke, the treatment is antiplatelets. For venous strokes, the treatment is anticoagulants. We have two types, arterial and venous. Arterial strokes are because of endothelial injury. When there is endothelial injury, there is platelet aggregation, agglutination, and therefore we have to give antiplatelet drugs which is known as white thrombus. Whereas if it's a venous stroke, there is no endothelial injury. When there's no endothelial injury, there's no need of platelets. There is, there is no platelet agglutination or aggregation. So there's no need of antiplatelet therapy. In fact, there are no, not much platelets. There's more of fibrin. That's why on red blood corpuscles, that's why you call this red thrombus. So venous stroke is not because of endothelial injury. It is because of fibrin, it is because of stasis. You remember virtuous triad you must have read in your pathology. Stasis of the blood, blood wall abnormality, blood constituent abnormality. These three are the important causes for thrombosis, virtuous triad. So in venous stroke, there is stasis of blood. <coughs> so there's red blood corpus, which is known as red thrombus. So when there are no platelets, there's no role for antiplatelets. We give anticoagulant drugs like warfarin or acitrone. So oral anticoagulants become very important in treatment of stroke in two conditions. One, venous strokes. Second, cardioembolic strokes like atrial fibrillation. Again, there's no endothelial injury. There's only stasis of the blood. <clears throat> so the, for these two reasons, we give only anticoagulant drugs. Sexual history, HIV, neurosyphilis, vegetarians, vitamin B12 deficiency, geographical location, multiple sclerosis in India, tuberculosis. <clears throat> Drug history, aminoglycosides, especially myasthenia gravis, neuromuscular junction disorder, Autotoxic dizziness. Wing Christian can cause peripheral neuropathy. Immune suppressants like cyclosporin can cause encephalopathy. Vitamin A excess can cause pseudotumor cerebri. B6 peripheral neuropathy. Surprisingly, proton pump inhibitors can cause headache. We need to be careful. We, we have a tendency to give proton in, uh, pump inhibitors on a long term basis. We need to be careful. It can cause headache. Anticholinergic drugs can cause confusion, especially in elderly people. Family history, Huntington's disease, Charcot Marie 2 disease, multiple sclerosis, migraine, epilepsy, hypertension, diabetes, neurofibromatosis, Wilson's disease, mitochondrial disease. For all these, family history becomes important. Right. 
we have to ask the history of other systems with neurologic relevance. Face, deviation of the angle of the mouth, seventh nerve palsy, UMN, inability to close the eyes, seventh nerve, LMN, pain over the face, fifth nerve, trigeminal neuralgia, headache, meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, tumor, migraine, hemorrhage with raised ICT. As I said, when the meninges get affected, persons will have headache. Eyes and vision, scintillating scotoma, photosensitivity, migraine, eye pain, optic neuritis, ptosis, myasthenia gravis, episodic visual loss, amaurosis fugax, progressive visual loss, optic neuropathy, double vision, three, four, six nerves. If there's a double vision on near objects, medial rectus gets affected, third nerve palsy. Double vision on, on long-term objects, looking at long-term, six nerve gets affected. Double vision on, on, uh, on looking at far-off objects is a six nerve palsy. CVA, diatus manitus, posture communicating attorneyism can come as third nerve, can cause double vision, trauma, myasthenia gravis, there'll be ptosis. <coughs> Hearing loss, acoustic neuroma, vertigo, vestibulopathy, tinnitus, manus disease. If you find vesicles, herpes zoster, anosmia, two important causes of anosmia. One of the most common causes, trauma, head injury. It affects the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. There can be rhinorrhea. Always suspect anosmia. The, the olfactory filaments get torn off. Sometimes it can be permanent also. So anosmia always asks history of head injury. All factory groom, meningioma, discharge, CSF, rhinorrhea. Next, stiffness, meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage. If the pain, radiculopathy. Cardiovascular system again becomes very important, especially CVA. Atrial fibrillation, irregular, irregular pulse, thrombus formation again, uh, thromboembolism, cerebral embolism. Hypertension can give rise to hemorrhage as well as infarction. In fact, one of the most modifiable important risk factors for stroke is hypertension. And one of the most important modifiable risk factors for coronary artery disease, dyslipidemia. Very important. For heart attack, dyslipidemia is an important risk factor. For brain attack, hypertension is an important risk factor. For claudication, neurogenic or vascular disease, PVD, lumbar canal stenosis, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, carotid bruise, stroke. Respiratory tuberculosis can give rise to meningitis. Breathlessness could be because of neuromuscular junction disorder like myasthenia, gravis, gulen barrick syndrome, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Asthma, there could be systemic vasculitis. Gastrointestinal, if they have excessive thirst, diatus mellitus, or diatus insipidus. If there's a vomiting, it could be raised intracranial tension, constipation, diarrhea, dysautonomia, especially diatus mellitus. Genitourinary, urinary incontinence, retention, could be neurogenic bladder, erectile dysfunction, especially loss of early morning spontaneous erections in male. Suggest of dysautonomia, polyuria, diatus mellitus, diatus insipidus. A pregnant lady comes with recurrent history of spontaneous abortions, arterial and venous stroke, always suspect antiphospholipid syndrome. Menstrual history, cataminal epilepsy and headache, oral contraceptives because of excess estrogen content, they are likely to develop strokes. Endocrine, diatus mellitus can cause neuropathy, ischemic stroke. Thyroid can cause neuropathy or myopathy. Mastospheric skeletal. Spine and foot, scoliosis and pest cavus, hereditary neuropathy. When we are examining a neurology patient, we always talk about foot and skull and spine. Why is it important? It is important in neurology, especially chronic neurological process, hereditary neuropathies, Frederick's attacks. Why? When there's a chronic neuropathy process like hereditary neuropathy, they affect the paravertebral muscles unequally. They affect the paravertebral muscles unequally. So there's a scoliosis, kyphoscoliosis. Again, they affect the, affect the foot muscles unequally. So there's a high arch foot. So high arch foot or, or kyphosis or kypho, kyphoscoliosis, always because of long-standing chronic neuropathies like hereditary neuropathies. If there's muscle pain, it could be myositis, inflammatory muscle disease, proximal muscle weakness, myopathy, distal muscle weakness, neuropathy. If there are birth marks, <coughs> Neurocutaneous disorders. Why we always take out on skin when we examine a CNS cause? Because CNS and skin arise from ectoderm. So neurocutaneous markers. <coughs> Hematologic, bleeding disorders. Bleeding from the mucosal surface, gums, vagina, rectum, antipatriot agents. Bleeding into muscles and joints, hemophilia, anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, subacute combined degeneration. The person has got visual hallucination, Lewy body dementia, auditory hallucination, schizophrenia, and alcoholism, Capgras system syndrome, misidentification, Alzheimer's dementia, grandiose ideas, neurosyphilis. <coughs>
<coughs> now I'll talk about common neurological disorders. For stroke, we should always ask, check out for negative symptoms, weakness, sensory, speech, sudden in onset, history of hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, smoking, alcoholism. For headache, migraine, cluster headache, tension type headache, migraine, unilateral, hemicranial, associated with GI, gastrointestinal disturbances like nausea, vomiting, classic migraine, migraine with aura has visual symptoms like scotoma, fortification, and neurological accompaniment. They usually seek relief by lying quietly in a room and dark and quiet environment. Cluster headache, they tend to be unilateral, non pulsatile orbitofrontal, without GI visual neurologic accompaniment. But then they tend to get relief by moving about. Migraine, they tend to get relief by lying quietly. Cluster headache, they tend to get relief by moving about. Tension type headache, they tend to have bilateral headache, band like, non pulsatile without GI visual or neurologic accompaniment. Epilepsy, body position, unrelated, unlike synco, which occurs on standing, tonic clonic activity, focal generalized, tongue bite, incontinence. Posterior confusion and deficit. Vertigo related to body position. BPPV, benign positional paroxysmal vertigo. Peripheral vertigo usually has nausea, vomiting, tinnitus, hearing loss, VOR, dysfunction, whereas central vertigo will have weakness, brainstem, weakness, numbness, diplopia, dysarthria, and dysphagia. Neck pain, backache, and numbness. Radiculopathy aggravated by cough. Cervical radiculopathy, pain radiating below the elbow, pain with movement of the neck. Lumbar radiculopathy, weakness and sensory disturbance in the involved territory. Carpal tunnel syndrome, we do not know the actual reason, but nocturnal symptoms are more common. So the most important, summarizing the most important point of history taking is attentive listening. Quote, just listen to the patient, he is telling you the diagnosis. Unquote, William Oster. Sudden onset followed by improvement with variable degrees of recovery is trauma or vascular. Subacute onset is infection or inflammation. Chronic is degenerative or chronic infections. Relaxing and remitting is demyelinative. Right. First part is important history taking. By history taking, you can find out what is the lesion. Etiology. By examination, we are trying to find out where is the lesion, anatomy. So when you call both correlate together with the help of investigation, you finally clinch the diagnosis. So history taking is very important in terms of etiology. What is the lesion? Is it vascular? Is it demyelinative? Now we are going for examination to find out where the lesion is, anatomy, with the cortex, brainstem, spinal cord. So, but then before actually going to the neurological examination, we have to examine the relative systems pertaining to the neurology. Vital signs, hypertension, compensatory phase of ischemic stroke, Cushing's reflex or subarachnoid hemorrhage, orthostatic hypotension like syncope, diabetic neuropathy, multiple system atrophy or anti-hypertensive therapy. Pulse, if there is bradycardia, you think of Cushing's reflex. Cushing's reflex is, indicates that there's a raised intracranial tension and impending coning. So body tries to compensate by increasing the blood pressure by causing hypertension, bradycardia, and irregular respiration. So this is a triad for Cushing reflex. Bradycardia, hypertension, and irregular respiration. So bradycardia, it could be Cushing's reflex. Bonding pulse, it could be aortic regurgitation, hyperthyroidism. Slow, small pulse, aortic stenosis, irregular pulse, atrial fibrillation, arrhythmia, cerebral hyperperfusion. Then we look at the general appearance. If it is weight loss, it is hyperthyroidism, spastic hemiparesis, it is cerebral vascular action. I said <coughs> the weakness. Severe produces spastic gait. That is, the tone is increased in flexors of the upper limb and extensors of the lower limb. So they flex the upper limb, they extend the lower limb, so they cannot flex the ground. So to clear the ground, they encircle and walk. Classic subconduction gait, spastic hemiparesis, severe. Parkinson's disease, they have flexed posture. Myopathy is affects the muscles, so they'll have lower doses. Protrusion of the muscle, waddling gait. Gluteus medius gets affected, so they cannot fix the gait. When they walk, they'll have waddling gait. They have hypertrophy of the cause. Example, uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Hereditary neuropathy, unequal weakness of paravertebral muscles. They'll have scoliosis. Unequal muscles, weakening of the foot muscles. They'll have pescavus. Ulnar neuropathy will have claw hand, radial neuropathy will have wrist drop, common peroneal neuropathy will have foot drop. Head, abnormal head is cervical dystonia and superior oblique palsy. Superior oblique is responsible for intortion. So when they cannot intort, they compensate by turning the head towards the opposite side, known as head tilt side or Belchowski side. Big size head, hydrocephalus, abnormal shaped head, premature closure of cranial sutures, head injury. When there's battle sign, ecchymosis or the mastoid, Indicates basal skull fracture. 
If there's ichymosis around the eye, we call it as raccoon sign. You will have seen a lot of persons with head injury. They'll have ichymosis around the eye, which is known as raccoon sign. Raised ICP in children will have bulging of the fontanel tubes at separation, skull defect, they'll have meningocele and kephrosteel, or auscultation, they'll have ocular brui and carotid brui. Hydrocephalus, massive head prior to suture, closure, frontal bossing, trans illumination. Mickey one sign is a sign to detect hydrocephalus and brain abscess. When you look at the face, there could be port wine angioma, which is suggested of Sturge Weber syndrome, characteristic phase is seen in myotonic dystrophy, procure is a surprise sign is seen in progressive supranuclear palsy, mask like or expression like a less phase is seen in Parkinson's disease. The fine telangiectasis, it could be ataxia telangiectasis, especially in children. Hyperthyroidism causes exophthalmus. Vesicles are seen in herpes zoster ophthalmicus. RK senescence is seen in atherosclerosis. Hemotympanum is seen in temporal bone fractures, basilar skull fractures, vesicles in herpes zoster infection. Nose, mouth, and throat. Saddle type of nose is in congenital syphilis. CSF rhinorrhea head injury. Macroglossia is myxedema. Tongue bites we see in seizures, neuroacanthocytosis, Leshnian syndrome. Notch teeth we see in congenital syphilis, such as teeth. Christmas, we see in tetanus and polymyositis, mucosal ulceration, Behet's disease. <coughs> Neck stiffness, uh, neck uh, swelling, thyroid swelling, neck rigidity, meningitis and SAH, short neck in craniovertebral anomalies like Klippelfeld fill syndrome. Lehermet said when a person flexes the head, there'll be electric shock like sensation going down the spine because of the posterior column involvement. If you see in young patients, think of multiple sclerosis. If you see this sign in old persons, think of cervical spondylosis. Carotid stenosis, that can be palpation of the carotid arteries to see carotid stenosis. Raised ICP, I said it can cause irregular respiration, so Cushing's reflex. Respiratory failure is seen in Gullain Barry syndrome, myasthenia gravis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, respiratory pattern. Very interesting. If cerebral cortex gets affected, there will be chain strokes breathing, waxing, waning. When it comes slowly down to midbrain, they have central neurogenic hyperventilation. They keep on hyperventilating. When it comes to pawns, they'll have apneustic breathing. They take a deep inspiration, pause, and then expiration. Then when it comes to middle oblongate, it becomes chaotic breathing, which is known as biox breathing. Cardiovascular system, hypertension, atherosclerosis, endocarditis, arrhythmia, valvular disease, all the above produces characteristic neurologic complications. Abdomen, there can be great earnest sign indicating of ichymosis of the flank, maybe due to lumbosacral plexopathy, due to retropetal hematoma, Hepatomegaly, we see in cirrhosis, carcinoma, hepatic encephalopathy, splenomegaly, storage disorders like glycogen storage disorders. Genitalia and rectum, we have to look at the sphincter tone, myelopathy, cardiopenia or conus medullaris, Fabris disease, there can be angiomas on the scrotum, lymph nodes, lymphadenopathy like phenyton, HIV, lymphoma, infectious mononucleosis. Spine, we always think of, we should always look for gibbous, mark kyphosis like tuberculosis, lumbar lordosis, muscular dystrophy, scoliosis, Frederick's attacks or syringomyelia, Dimple of the skin, skin tack, unusual hair growth or the sacrum, spinal dystrophic state, tethered cord syndrome. Why the brain and spine generally get affected together? Because they are both derived from ectoderm. Charcoal's joint, painless arthropathy when joint is deafferented, arthropathy, connective tissue disorder, decreased peripheral pulses, atherosclerosis, hypermobile joints, Marfan syndrome, and Ehlers Danlos syndrome, Palmar erythema, alcohol abuse. Hair and nail, alopecia and balding, myotonic dystrophy. Mees lines, transverse, uh, discovery of nails in arsenic poisoning, clubbing of the hands in bronchogenic carcinoma, abnormal may, may, nail capillary dermatomyces such as skin painless, poorly healing skin lesion, syringomyelia. The crossing spinal thalamic tract gets affected, so pain and temperature is lost. They cannot appreciate pain, so they'll have poorly healing skin ulcers, hereditary sensory neuropathy, spider angioma, they drink too much of alcohol, purpura indicates meningococcemia, erythema chronicum migraines. Uh, Lyme's disease, libidoreticularis is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. When there are skin lesions along with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, we call that as Sneddon syndrome. Grease and seborrheic skin in Parkinson disease, vesicular lesion in herpes zoster, characteristic lesions of dermatocytes, dry skin in Repsom's disease, angiomatosis in Fabris disease. Yeah, this is about the examination when we talk about the neurological examination, other systems in relevance with neurology. Now we do a proper neurologic examination. The neurologic examination begins with assessment of mental status, cranial nerves, motor system, reflexes, sensory system, and finally coordination and gait. Mental system, exam, mental status examination, level of consciousness. We can go by Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, we can see whether a person is, uh, is able to understand our response, whether he's in a conscious state, stuporous or drowsy state. Orientation, we check out whether a person is oriented to 
time, place, and person. Orientation to time is the first which gets lost. Speech and language. As I said, speech and language, three important components. Comprehension gets affected, vernix aphasia, repetition gets affected, arcuate fascicle gets affected, conduction aphasia, fluency gets affected, broadcast aphasia. If the arcuate fascicle is spared, that means repetition is intact, which is the characteristic features of transcortical motor or transcortical sensory aphasias. Memory, we have immediate memory, recent memory, long-term memory. Immediate memory, we give three articles, unrelated articles, ask him to repeat immediately. If he's able to repeat it, his immediate memory is good. That means it goes to the frontal lobe, attention is good. Three unrelated articles, ask him to repeat after 10 minutes. If he's able to repeat it, that means his recent memory is good. That means hippocampus temporal lobe is good. Long-term memory, personal events, childhood events, long-term memory. There are three related memories like immediate, recent, and long-term. Immediate memory, we otherwise known as working memory, very close to it. Recent memory, we call it as episodic memory when it pertains to episodes. And long-term memory is because of personal events, but if it is extra personal events come, uh, related to facts, we call it as semantic memory. Another memory is there, which is known as procedural memory, where it is related to the procedure, like cycling or swimming. Uh, that is a procedural memory. So we check immediate memory, recent memory, long-term memory, fund of information, insight and judgment, abstract thinking, similarity between various objects, and calculation ability. Cranial nerves, olfactory nerve, testing of smell, usual, usual and suspicion of inferior frontal, inferior frontal lobe, like meningitis, meningioma. For optic nerve, basically we, the, we do three tests. One visual acuity, Snellen's chart, field of vision by confrontation method. Field of vision becomes very, very important. In fact, there has been one, uh, one good MCQ question which I've seen that a person walking on the road, a car coming, is not able to see the two headlines, hits the car. What is your diagnosis? The diagnosis is pituitary adenoma. He's not able to see the two headlights placed sideways. That means bitemporal hemianopia. So the simple clinical test confrontation method, we can even diagnose pituitary adenoma. We can later confirm it by imaging. So field of vision becomes very, very important by confrontation method. Optic fundi, we check out with ophthalmoscope. The third now, it produces a classic 4Ds, dilatation of the pupil because the parasympathetic fibers causes constriction of the pupil, drooping of the eyelid because the levator palpable superior is affected, divergent skin, since the medial rectus is affected, lateral rectus supplied by 6 now will overtake, there will be divergent skin. Because of this divergent skin, there's double vision. A very important clinical point in third nerve palsy is that the parasympathetic fibers run superficially on the third nerve. So any extensing compression on the third nerve, like, like hernia or posterior communicating artery aneurysm, first compresses the superficially placed parasympathetic fibers. So pupillary constriction cannot play, take place, pupillary dilatation is seen. This is known as Hutchinson sign. So pupil is first affected, early affected in a compressive lesion of the third nerve. If it's an intrinsic lesion of the third nerve, it affects and causes all the other three Ds, but it usually spares the pupil because their parasympathetic lies run superficially. So in a dietic third nerve palsy, it is usually the pupil is spared. Sometimes it is known as pupillary sparing third nerve palsy. Very important clinical point. Extrinsic compression, the pupillary fibers are the first to get affected. Intrinsic pathology of the third nerve, the pupil is the last to get affected. Fourth nerve, it supplies the superior oblique, which causes intortion. So when they are not able to turn the superior oblique intort, they turn the head to the opposite side, which is known as Belchowski sign or head tilt sign. Trigenal now, sensory ophthalmic division, maxillary division, mandibular division. The heart resorptive affects usually the ophthalmic division of the trigenal now, whereas trigenal neuralgia usually affects the other two divisions of the third nerve. So heart resorptive ophthalmicus, trigenal neuralgia, maxillary and mandibular division. Motor component, we check on the jaw jerk, the jaw jerk, corneal reflex, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve is the afferent, and efferent is the bilateral seventh nerve. So when you touch the cornea, both the eyelids should close. Sixth nerve, lateral rectus. So if there's a sixth nerve abnormality. Person cannot use the lateral rectus, so they'll have double vision on looking at far off objects. Seventh nerve, basically, all cranial nerves have got bilateral innervation, except seventh nerve. The lower part gets innervation only on the opposite side not from the same side. Very, very important point, especially for undergraduates. That's why in stroke patients, we don't see any cranial nerve getting affected except seventh nerve. Why? All other cranial nerves have got bilateral innervation, except seventh nerve, which has got unilateral innervation from the opposite side. So upper motor neuron lesion of the seventh nerve causes lower part of the face being affected on the opposite side, 
whereas the lower motor neuron lesion of the basal nerve will affect the upper part and the lower part on the same side very very important so when we are checking out of the facial now we test for eyebrow elevation forehead wrinkling eye closure smiling cheek puffing we should always look for differences in lower versus upper facial muscles upper motor neuron lesion causes weakness of the lower facial muscles with preservation of upper facial muscles whereas weakness of the entire side of the face is seen in element type of lesion eighth you now has got two components vestibular component and the cochlear component cochlear component whispered voice is basically concerned with hearing we do rhenes test the principle is air conduction is better than bone conduction we do weber's test vestibular co component cows cold opposite warm same and then romberg said i would like to talk about cows here cold opposite warm same this time because a lot of students get confused here when the vestibular apparatus gets stimulated it pushes the eyes to the opposite side normally because it connects the pprf on the opposite side so eyes are pushed towards the opposite side so when the eyes are pushed to the opposite side body and brain tries to maintain homeostasis by pushing eyes back to the midline so the front lifefield area number 8 will try to push it to the midline so when we stimulate the vestibular apparatus either by turning the head or by pouring warm water the eyes go to the opposite side but nystagmus will be to the same side so cows warm same side when we put cold water we are inhibiting vestibular apparatus so this vestibular apparatus will overact and push the eyes to the side of the lesion but nystagmus front eye fields area number 8 will try to push eyes to the opposite side so nystagmus will be on the opposite side cold opposite side nystagmus warm same side of nystagmus romberg sign as i said the proprioception position joint vibration sense by posterior column or eighth you nerve know, ocular and uh, vestibular cerebellar connections are responsible for balance so if two systems get affected person loses balance that is the principle of romberg sign ninth and tenth you nerve know, ninth is gloss of pharyngeal sensations tenth is vagus motor so observe the position and symmetry of the palate uvular rest with phonation and gag reflex gag reflex is when you put and try to stimulate the posterior wall there be retraction of the pharynx elevation of the a, a retraction of the palate and elevation of the pharynx 11th you now trapezius shrugging of the shoulder turning the head to the opposite side is the sternocleidomastoid again a very important point when the right cortex gets affected generally cranial nerves don't get affected because they have bilateral innervation 7th you now gets affected because it has got unilateral from the uh, supply from the opposite side 11th nerve has got a predominant supply from the same side of the cortex so when the right cortex gets affected same side sternocleidomastoid gets affected so they turn, cannot turn the head to the opposite side the other sternocleidomastoid will will overact the head is turned to the same side so in a cortical lesion head is turned to the same side eyes also cannot be pushed to the opposite side front life is area number 8 gets affected eyes also will be looking to the same side hemiplegia on the opposite side so head and eyes turning to one side hemiplegia on the opposite side it's a cortical lesion 12th nerve inspect the tongue for atrophy fasciculation position protrusion of the end strength when an extended against the inner surface of the cheek on each side the 12th nerve has got a tendency to push the tongue on the opposite side so if the 12th nerve gets affected it cannot push the tongue on the opposite side tongue moves the same side 5th nerve also jaw it tries to push the jaw to the opposite side when it gets affected jaw moves to the same side so 12th and 5th nerve 12 plus 5 is 17 if 12th nerve and 5th nerve gets affected the movement will be towards a diseased side whereas 10th now the palate goes to the healthier side 7th now again the face goes to the healthier side so 10 plus 7 is also 17 12 plus 5 is also 17 10 plus 5 is 17 when 10th now and 5th now gets affected the movement will be towards the healthier side 12 plus 5 is also 17 but when 12th now and 5th now gets affected the movement will be towards the diseased side so very easy to remember is rule of 17 12 plus 5 and 10 plus 7. 12 plus 5, the movement will be towards the disease side. 10 plus 7, 17, the movement will be towards the healthier side. Right. So far, I said so many things about the brainstem, but then there's a chance for confusion. How to remember so many structures in the brainstem? Very easy way to remember. Like as I said, for rule of 17, for 12, 5, 10, and 7. Now I'm going to tell a very, very important rule. Rule of four. Just remember the rule of four, and you remember entire brainstem. rule of four there are four cranial nerves in the three brain stem structures three cranial nerves in sorry four cranial nerves in medulla oblongata four cranial nerves in pons four cranial nerves two in the midbrain and two above the midbrain so four cranial nerves in midbrain and above four cranial nerves in pons four cranial nerves in medulla oblongata so one and two is above the midbrain three and four are in the midbrain five six seven eight are in the pons 9 10 11 12 are in the medulla oblongata i'm telling you very very easy way to remember the entire brain stem structure by rule of four 
So rule of four, the first component is that there are four cranial nerves in midbrain and above, four cranial nerves in pons, and four cranial nerves in medial abdomen. Fine, over. So now you know if it's a pontine, it means either five, six, seven, eight should get affected. If it's a medial oblong, it means nine, ten, eleven, twelve should get affected. If it's in midbrain, means three and four are affected. Fine. Now, of these cranial nerves, which cranial nerves are placed medially and which cranial nerves are placed laterally? The cranial nerves which divide 12 into equal parts are placed medially. The cranial nerves which cannot divide 12 into equal parts are placed laterally. So we have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 3 and 4 cranial nerves can divide 12 into equal parts. 12 by 3 is 4, 12 by 4 is 3. So 3 and 4 cranial nerves are placed medially in the midbrain. Now in pons, we have 5, 6, 7, 8. Of these four cranial nerves, only six can divide 12 into equal parts. So 12 by six is two equal parts. So six cranial nerves placed medially, whereas five, seven, and eight, which cannot divide 12 into equal parts, are placed laterally in the pons. In medial oblongata, we have nine, 10, 11, 12 cranial nerves. But of all these four cranial nerves, only 12 can divide 12 into one equal parts. So 12 is placed medially, whereas nine, 10, 11 are placed laterally. Over. Cranial nerves in brainstem is over. So three and four are in the midbrain. They are placed medially. Five, six, seven, eight cranial nerves are in the pons. Only six cranial nerves are placed medially. Five, seven, eight are placed laterally. Nine and 10, 11, 12 cranial nerves are in the medial, medial oblongata. Only 12 cranial nerves are placed medially, whereas nine, 10, 11 are placed laterally. That's why in lateral medullary syndrome, Wallenberg syndrome, the 12th cranial nerve is spared because it is medially placed. Right. So far, we have understood about the cranial nerves in the brainstem. Now let's see the structures. There are motor structures and sensory structures in the brainstem. How do we remember? Very easy. The structures which start with the letter M are placed medially. M for M. The structures which start with the letter M are placed medially. M for M. The structures which start with the letter S are placed sideways. S for S. So letters, the structures which start with the letter S are placed sideways. S for S. The structures which start with the letter M are placed medially, M for M. So what are the structures which start with the letter M and which are placed medially? First and foremost is the motor tract. That is the corticospinal tract. That is medially placed. So M for M, motor tract, the corticospinal tract is medially placed. All the motor components of the cranial nerve are medially placed. Medial lemniscus, that is the posterior column, is medially placed. Medial longitudinal fasciculus, MLF, which connects third, fourth, sixth, and eighth nodes, are placed medially. So four structures which start with the letter M are placed medially. Motor tract, that is a corticospinal tract. Motor part of the cranial nerves. Medial lemniscus, that is a posterior column. And me MLF, medial longitudinal fasciculus, are placed medially. That's why in Wallenberg syndrome, you don't have hemiplegia because corticospinal tract is medially placed. The 12th nerve is not affected. The posterior column is not affected because they are placed medially. Now we'll go sideways. Easy to remember sideways as remembering lateral medullary syndrome because it is the lateral part of the medulla gets affected. So if we remember Wallenberg syndrome, we remember all the four structures which start with the letter S. So structures which start with the letter S are placed sideways. So sensory part of the cranial nerves, especially the trigeminal nerve gets affected. So there's ipsilateral facial sensory loss. The spinothalamic tract gets affected. So pain and temperature is lost on the opposite side. So in Wallenberg syndrome, the pain and temperature is lost on the same side of the face and pain and temperature is lost on the opposite side of the face because opposite side because trigeminal nerve, the spinal tract of the trigeminal, the sensory tract of the trigeminal gets affected and then spinal thalamic tract gets affected. The third is the sympathetic tract. The sympathetic tract gets affected which causes dilatation of the pupils so when it gets affected there's meiosis. So sympathetic tract is also placed sideways and spinocerebellar tracts, they are also placed sideways. So four structures which start with the letter S, which are placed sideways are sensory tracts of the cranial nerves, especially the trigeminal nerve, the spinothalamic tract, the sympathetic tract, and the spinocerebellar fibers. So if we know this rule of four, easy to place brainstem structures. So there are four cranial nerves which start, which are in the present in midbrain, pons, and medial oblongata. The cranial nerves which divide 12 into equal parts are placed medially, that is three, four, six, and 12. The cranial nerves which don't divide 12 into equal parts are placed laterally. The structures which start with the letter M are placed medially. Four structures, motor tract, corticospinal tract, motor part of the cranial nerves, medial longitudinal fasciculus, and medial lemniscus. The four structures which start with the letter S are placed sideways. 
the sensory tract of the trigeminal nerve, the spinothalamic tract, the sympathetic tract, and the spinocerebellar tract. So if you know this, brainstem is very, very easy to approach, which is known as rule of four. So you are done with rule of four and rule of 17, which is most of the neurology is over, especially brainstem. Now we'll come to the motor examination. Appearance, muscle atrophy or fasciculations, it is lower motor neuron type, anti cell like disease like motor neuron disease or poliomyelitis. If the tone is hypertonia and equal in all groups of muscles, it is rigidity, cogwheel rigidity or lead pipe rigidity. Lead pipe rigidity superimposed with tremors, you call this cogwheel rigidity, it is extra pyramidal. But it affects selectively group of muscles like flexors of the upper limb and extensors of the lower limb, anti-gravity muscles. We call that as spasticity, classic example, circumduction gate, which we see in cerebrovascular actions, pyramidal tract lesion. Strength, upper limbs, very, very important. I keep repeating pronata drift. Corticospinal tract, innervated muscles are the supinator, wrist and finger extensor. So when the supinator gets affected, the pronator will overtake, so there will be pronata drift. Strength of the wrist and uh, finger extensors become weak. In the lower limb, the flexors become weak. The strength of the flexors become weak, like uh, knee flexors, dorsiflexors. Walking on the heels means that his dorsiflexion is strong. L5 is good. If a person is able to walk on the toes, that means the plantar flexion is good. That means S1 is good. So upper limbs, we should always check on the pronator grip, strength of the wrist and finger extensors. For lower limbs, we have to check the strength of the flexors. Walking on the heels, L5. Walking on the toes is S1. Pyramidal weakness, as I said, it affects the extensors of the upper limb and the weakness is there in the lower limb. So upper limb extensors and lower limb flexors are very characteristic of pyramidal weakness. If it is myopathy, there will be bilateral proximal weakness. If it is neuropathy, there will be bilateral distal weakness. Muscle stretch reflexes, we check out on bicep C5, brachioradial C7, C6, tricep C7, finger flexors C8 and T1, petlar L3, L4, ankle S1, S2. Why we elicit deep tendon reflexes? To place the lesion. At the level of the lesion, there'll be LMN signs. Below the level of the lesion, there'll be UMN signs. Above the lesion, it is normal. For example, we'll take triceps C7. So C5 and C6 are intact. So biceps and brachioradialis are intact, normal. Triceps C7 gets affected. So including the anti cell of C7 gets affected. So triceps jerk is lost. But for finger flexors, patellar and ankle reflex, the corticospinal tract at the level of C7 is cut off. So for these, it becomes human because the anterior horn cells of petlar and, and achilles is, is intact. But the corticospinal tract is cut off at the level S1, C7. So the petlar ankle reflexes for it, it becomes a human lesion. So petlar ankle reflexes becomes exaggerated. So at the level of the lesion, there'll be element sign. Below the level of the lesion, there'll be human sign. Above the level of the lesion, it will be normal. Cutaneous reflexes, abdominal reflexes, it is, it is polysynaptic, so it can be absent in corticospinal tract lesions. Very important is beaver sign, supplied by T10 umbilicus. So if there's a lesion below T10, when we try to sit from um, lying down position, the upper abdominal muscles contact, the umbilicus is pushed, pushed, pulled upwards. It indicates the lesion is at T10 and below. Uh, that's why the upper abdominal muscles pull it up. So when you see the umbilicus moving upwards, it is beaver sign. The lesion is at uh, T10 and below. Primitive reflexes. You have grasping reflex, sucking reflex, palm mental reflex. Uh, all these reflexes, uh, grasping reflex, avoiding reflex, all these reflexes are present in our infancy. But when we become mature, say by one year, the myelination takes place and all these reflexes disappear. So generally, these reflexes are present in our infancy because they are immature. They don't have myelination. Once they mature, become mature, these reflexes disappear. If there is persistence of these reflexes beyond one year, that means there is no maturity of the uh, cortex, especially frontal and parietal lobes or these reflexes disappear, but at the later point of time, it re-emerges. Then again, the frontal and parietal lobe are affected and the myelation is affected. So primitive reflexes are normally present before infancy and they should disappear after infancy. But persistence of reflexes beyond infancy and disappearance and re-emergence of reflexes again indicates that the lesion of the cortex, especially frontal and parietal lobes. Right, sensations. Basically, we have two types of sensation, primary sensations and cortical sensation. All the sensations are ascending, coming from the skin and going to the parietal cortex through the thalamus. So all the sensations perceived from the skin to the thalamus are primary sensations like touch, pain, temperature, vibration, joint sense. But sensations perceived from the thalamus to the parietal cortex, we call that as cortical sensations like tactile localization, two-point discrimination, graphesthesia, barognosis.
so tactile localization two point discrimination stereognosis barognosis graphesthesia are all cortical sensations so if primary sensations are intact but the cortical sensations are affected that means it indicates a lesion is in the parietal lobe and second thing two point discrimination is highly sensitive in the lips and the fingertips why because according to the sensory homonucleus the representation for the lips and fingertips are more than the other areas so they become very sensitive two point discrimination they are felt separately as two distinct points in the lips and the fingertips very very important point is that if you are if you are uh, approaching a neurology case and within few minutes you need to make a diagnosis examine the sensory pathways examine the motor pathways i'll give a very very important clue for motor pathways the simplest and the best test we can do is pronator drift if a person has got pronator drift that means his motor pathways are affected likewise it is better to assess the sensory pathways in detail but if you do not have time or you have to finish off the diagnosis very quickly sensory examination the one test simple test but best test to do is stereognosis give a, a chain or coin and ask him to feel with eyes closed and say what it is this particular test will try to find out the intactness of the pathway right from the skin till the parietal lobe so for motor pathways the simplest bedside test to be done is pronator drift for sensory pathways the simplest test to be done is the stereognosis so cortical sensation they are mediated by parietal lobe and represents an integration of the primary sensory modalities testing cortical sensation is only meaningful when primary sensations are intact for cerebellum cerebellum is responsible for the fine movement for example if i want to button my shirt taking my hands come into the button hole it can be done by corticospinal tract but the fine delicate movement is done by two systems one cerebellum second basal ganglia and therefore when the basal ganglia gets affected there are either hypokinetic movements decreased movement like parkinsons or hyperkinetic movement excessive movements like chorea caudate nucleus if the cerebellum gets affected the exact fine tuning the comparator gets affected and therefore they cannot fine tune the exact, either they undershoot or overshoot especially the alternating movements are, are difficult for them to perform that's why they cannot perform dystadocokinesia or rebound phenomena sudden change in the alternate movement they cannot do it the agonistic contraction is persisting they cannot suddenly change over to antagonist and that's why they'll have a pendular knee jerk also they cannot hold on so cerebellum is responsible for fine tuning fine adjustment it is a comparator second cerebellum if it gets affected the sudden switch from the agonistic contraction to antagonistic contraction cannot take place so rapid alternating movements of the hands and feet gets affected uh, finger nose also they get affected so gait finally gait if the cortico spinal tract gets affected as i said the tone is increased in the flexor of the, of the upper limb and extensors of the lower limb known as spasticity there's a, there's an increased resistance at the beginning of the movement but then it gives over it is known as clasp knife spasticity whereas rigidity the tone is increased but it affects all groups of muscles equally and lead pipe it is equal throughout the movement if it is superimposed with tremors you call it as cogwheel rigidity you see in parkinson's disease so spasticity clasp knife spasticity you find in uh, in cortico spinal tract lesions lead pipe rigidity you find in extra pyramidal tract uh, lesions and lead pipe rigidity superimposed with tremors you call that as parkinson disease cogwheel rigidity so cortico spinal tract the flexors of the upper limb and the extensors of the lower limb gets affected so they flex the upper limb extend the lower limb they cannot flex the knee so to clear the floor they encircle and walk very classic known as circumduction gait to so see a person walking with a circumduction gait you know the diagnosis it's a cortico spinal tract lesion short stepping gait is parkinson's disease there is a trap tremors a rigidity a kinesis and postural disturbances is parkinson's so they have lead pipe rigidity and they 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 have short stepping gait they take small steps they have expressionless face and they are stoop over so if you see such kind of gait you know it is parkinson's disease cerebellum as i said cerebellum is responsible for balance cerebellum basically you have three structures vestibular cerebellum which is responsible for eye movements so the vestibular cerebellum gets affected eye movements gets affected you can compare this with fish fish has got good eye movements so if the cerebellum vestibular cerebellum gets affected eye movements get affected as that of fish then you have the center of the cerebellum the vermis or the spino cerebellum which is responsible for gait movement especially alcohols vermis gets affected so they'll have uh, truncal ataxia the gait can be compared 
uh, with that of the snake. Snake, basically, you see the movement. So the vermis gets affected, the movement of the gate gets affected like that of a snake. The snake gets affected, cannot move, the gate gets affected. Then finally, you have the cerebellar hemispheres, the neocerebellum or the, the latest development of cerebellum, which are responsible for fine hand movements, dexterity. So if cerebellum gets affected, the fine coordinated movements of the hand gets affected, like that of a monkey. Monkey also has got a fine hand movements like human beings. So if it gets affected, it, it can be compared to that of a lesion uh, seen in monkeys. So vestibular cerebellum, eye movements get affected. You can compare it with the fish. Vermis gets affected. The gait gets affected. You can compare it with the snake. The cerebellar hemispheres get affected. You can compare with the fine hand movements. Can dexterity can be compared with the monkey. In fact, man is placed at a higher level in the hierarchy as compared to animals because of two reasons. One is intelligence and speech. Prefrontal lobe is extremely well developed in human beings. We are, that's why we are so very intelligent as compared to animals. Second is the way we use manipulate our fingers, manual dexterity. No animal, only monkey can, can, can come close to human beings. No animal can come anywhere close to the, with the way we use fingers like human beings. So humans are placed at the higher level of the hierarchy as compared to animals because of two reasons. One, intelligence and speech. Second, manual dexterity. So when the cerebellum gets affected, the fine coordination gets affected, the balance is affected, so they'll have broad-based gait. Spasticity. Uh, as I said, the flexors of the upper limb, extensors of the lower limb, and adductors of the lower limb, the tone is increased in the corticospinal tract lesion. So in both the corticospinal tract lesions get affected, like cerebral palsy, the adductors go in for hypertonia. So when they walk, adductor contacts, adductor contacts, adductor contacts, adductor contacts. It'd be like a scissoring gait. So scissoring gait is usually seen in children, cerebral palsy, because both the corticospinal tracts are involved. There's an increase in the tone in adductors. High stepping gait, peripheral nerve palsy. High stepping gait. The dorsiflexors are affected. So common peroneal nerve is affected. So they cannot dorsiflex the foot. So to clear the ground, they take high steps and then walk. Because dorsiflex, so they, they go and hit the ground. So to clear the ground, they have to take high steps and walk. So high stepping gait in, indicates that the common peroneal nerve is affected. So it results in a high stepping gait. Stamping gait, posterior columnation. Posterior column is responsible for feeling of the position joint sense. So the posterior column gets affected. They cannot feel the position and the hardness of the floor. So they have to stamp and then walk, know the hardness of the floor. So stamping gait indicates posterior columnation. Magnetic gait, they appear stuck in place. It is seen in frontal lobe lesions, apraxia. We call it as a gait apraxia. They can do movements well on the bed as a cycling movement, but when they are given the real movement to walk on the floor, they cannot walk. So this is known as apraxia of gait. It is seen in the, in the frontal lobe. Apraxia is an inability to perform a learned motor act. Inability to perform a learned motor act. Basically, there are three types, like ideation apraxia, idiomotor apraxia, and limb kinetic apraxia. I'll tell you one thing. Parietal lobe is responsible for planning of a movement and frontal lobe is responsible for actual execution of the movement. So the parietal lobe gets affected like idiomotor apraxia, but frontal lobe is intact. They cannot plan, but actual execution with the real lifetime object they can perform. Like if you ask, give him a toothbrush and ask him to brush his teeth, he can. But ask him to imagine and then and brush, he can't. So activities of daily living are not impaired in idiomotor apraxia because parietal lobe is affected, the planning is affected, but frontal lobe is intact. So execution, the real lifetime object, they can perform. And fortunately, idiomotor apraxia is more common in practice. It is the actually the doctor who picks up the complaint because person's activity of daily living are not impaired. In ideational apraxia, the frontal lobe per se is affected. So activities of daily living with the real lifetime object is affected. They cannot perform a real lifetime with a real lifetime object. They can do it bits and pieces. They cannot perform in a sequential manner. Ask him to smoke, he may take the cigarette correctly. But instead of lighting his cigarette, he may light the other person's cigarette. So bits and pieces he can do, but not in a sequential goal-directed movement. So activities of daily living are impaired in, in ideational apraxia, and person comes with the complaints. And this is less common as compared to idiomotor apraxia. Then we have sympathetic apraxia because of the the corpus callosum being affected. And if the frontal lobe gets affected, magnetic uh, gait, or they appear stuck. So uh, uh, on bed, they can pedal and show, but with real lifetime movement, or walking on the floor, they can't. And finally, always remember Bayam serum. Even in a tertiary institute, if a person has got stroke, it is because of atherosclerosis rather than vasculitis. If a person has got myoclonus or dementia, uh, 
you have to think of common disorders like Alzheimer's dementia rather than rather than prion disease, like Kruzfeldt Jacob disease. And therefore, always remember, even in a tertiary institute, the uncommon manifestations of common diseases are more common than the common manifestations of uncommon diseases. So common diseases are common. Always think with common sense. Common diseases are common. Always remember the uncommon manifestations of common diseases are more common than the common manifestations of the uncommon diseases. So with history, we are able to find out what is the lesion. With examination, we are able to find out where the lesion is. Now, how do we localize corroborating history and examination? So if cerebrum is involved, what happens? Brainstem, spinal cord, peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction, muscle, what happens? If cerebrum gets affected, there'll be abnormal mental status or cognitive impairment. There'll be seizures. If one side cortex gets affected, the opposite side, there'll be weakness and sensory abnormalities. There will be visual field abnormalities because the optic radiations get affected. You have the homonymous hemianopias. You have movement disorders, tremor and chorea, basal ganglia gets affected. If it is brainstem, ipsilateral cranial nopalsia and contralateral hemiplegia. Midbrain means third nopalsia on the same side, contralateral hemiplegia. Pons means 5, 6, 7, 8 on the same side and opposite hemiplegia. Middle oblong at 9, 10, 11, 12 on the same side and opposite side, hemiplegia or anesthesia. If it is spinal cord, there will be back pain or tenderness. Weakness and sensory abnormalities sparing the head. There'll be mixed upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. Then. Since the spinal cord is affected, the corticospinal tract gets affected and the anterior horn cells get affected. So they'll have mixed UM and LM and signs. There'll be a definite sensory level. There'll be sphincter disturbances. If it is spinal roots, there'll be a radiating limb pain, weakness and sensory abnormalities following root distribution and lo loss of reflexes. And at this point of a time, I feel making acronyms is very, very important to remember these myotomes and sensory dermatomes. For example, C5, I can always say C5, all the muscles innervated by C5 and what happens if the C5 gets affected. The muscles which get affected by C5 are biceps, infraspinatus, rhomboid, deltoid, supraspinatus. How am I telling so fast? I made an acronym of it, BIRDS, B-I-R-D-S. B for biceps, I for infraspinatus, R for rhomboids, D for deltoid, S for supraspinatus. So if you make an acronym, it is easy to remember all these myotomes and dermatomes. Peripheral nerve. It is a length dependent neuropathy, especially axonal. So distal parts get affected more than proximal parts. So they may have pain, weakness or so on, sensory abnormalities following nerve distribution. Glove and stocking type of sensory loss. Glove, the hand and stocking type of sensory loss. The stockings get affected. It's a length dependent neuropathy. So the distal parts don't get nutrition as compared to the proximal parts initially, but later everything gets affected. So distal parts being more affected than proximal parts, it's a neuropathy, they'll have loss of reflexes. Whereas if it is neuromuscular junction, the classic finding is easy fatigability. Morning they're all right, but evening they get weakened and weakened because it's a neuromuscular junction disorder or skeletal muscle. One of the famous Hindi film personalities is having myasthenia gravis. It's a neuromuscular junction disorder. So easy fatigue morning they are better and after some time they get worse. Classic exam is that if, if they are given to chew chicken, initially they are able to chew chicken well. But as the time elapses, chewing chicken becomes difficult. If that is the history you are getting it, that is the history forthcoming. It is myasthenia gravis, neuromuscular junction disorder, easy fatigability. So bilateral weakness, including face doses, diplopia, dysphagia, and proximal limbs. Usually pupils are spared in myasthenia gravis. Why? Because pupil is a smooth muscle, whereas myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular junction disorder of skeletal muscles. So if you find all other findings of the third nerve palsy, but pupil is spared, always think of myasthenia gravis. And increasing weakness with exertion, easy fatigability, sparing of sensation is neuromuscular junction disorder. Muscle, usually they'll have proximal muscle weakness. They'll have difficulty in getting from, from the squatting to the standing position. Classic exam, Duchenne's muscular disorder. They carry, they, they climb on themselves, get support, and then they try to stand up. This is known as Gower's set. Classically seen Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So they'll have more of proximal muscle weakness and sparing of sensations. Yeah. I gave a run through of history and examination, but if you want details of history, details of examination, details of examination, you go can go back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, where I have more than 5,850 subscribers and 225 videos. I made a separate video on history in neurology, separate video on examination in neurology, separate video on new localization in neurology. So if you can go through my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, you will still get better idea. And if you have any doubts, you can clarify with it. Clarify with me. But still, if you have doubts, you can always correspond to me either through my email or your YouTube channel or White Army.
I'm more than willing to answer your questions. But uh, this is an overview I've, I've given. If you have still doubts, you can go back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts. Yeah, there's a book I've written. Most of the concepts I put in a question and answer format. It is available in the book Focus Neurology online from all the leading book, uh, bookshops, including Amazon. And finally, I have to thank Dr. Kishan Rao, especially the White Army coordinator, organizer, administrator. Without him, this meeting would not have been possible. And it is because of him I am able to address students across the country. I thank the White Army, especially Dr. Kishan Rong, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, sir. And over to the organizers. I think I finished in time. So that was a wonderful lecture, sir. I hope all the students have uh, uh, benefited from this lecture, sir. Uh, there are a few more questions uh, from Marian, sir. Uh, first one will be, uh, what is the treatment of catamenial epilepsy, sir? Catamenial epilepsy, wonderful question. Uh, catamenial epilepsy is an epilepsy which you see only during the menstruation in women. Very good point you raised. I want to talk about a very important clinical point. Generally, when we start anti-epileptic drugs, it will be for days together, going on for weeks, months, and years. For example, phenytoin, phenobarbitone, carbamazepine, sodium valproate, levitristam, you have to give on a continuous basis. But here is an epilepsy or, or rather seizures, which come only during menstruation and then it stops. So what is the point? There's no point in giving an anti-epileptic drug continuously, but then these anti-epileptic drugs have to be given on a continuous uh, uh, nature. Likewise, hot water epilepsy. Some people get epilepsy seizures when they take hot water, described by Dr. Satish Chandra, one of the pioneer neurologists uh, of uh, Nimhans, Bangalore. Uh, he described uh, hot water epilepsy, uh, accepted all over the world. Sometimes in children, they throw seizures only when, get, when they get fever, known as febrile seizures. So there are certain seizures only which come only at a particular point of time. So for them, we have to give anti-epileptic drugs, which can be used for a short term basis and then can be stopped. The one drug which can be used for short term and then can stop is clobazam. Clobazam is a wonderful anti-epileptic drug which can be given for a short term basis and then stop. So for persons, for women having catamenial epilepsy, for children having febrile seizures or hot water epilepsy, you give clobazam only during that particular period where they are highly epileptogenic and then stop it. So clobazam is a wonderful treatment for short term seizures like catamenial epilepsy, febrile seizures and hot water epilepsy. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question will be, how can we examine autonomic nervous system in a bedridden patient? Yeah, it, it's, it's a big topic on its own, but basically I'll tell you three important points. One is the postural hypotension. Check the blood pressure on lying down, check the blood pressure on standing up. If there's a difference in blood pressure between the supine and sitting or standing up after say three minutes, of 20 systolic and 10 diastolic postural hypotension, it is the simplest and bed, best bedside test for the evaluation of autonomic nervous system dysfunction. And then you're all aware that autonomic nervous system has got basically two components. One is a sympathetic component and second is parasympathetic component. Now I'm going to talk about a very, very important clinical point. Parasympathetic component is basically to do with the heart rate. Sympathetic component is basically to do with the blood pressure. So generally when there are when we expect blood pressure changes either due to posture or due to valsalva manner, if you don't find these expected blood pressure changes, that means it's a sympathetic dysfunction. Again, when we expect uh, heart rate changes like postural changes or in terms of breathing sinus arrhythmia or valsalva manner, if the expected heart rate variability is not there, that means it is a parasympathetic dysfunction. So basically, we find out whether there's an autonomic nervous system dysfunction or not by postural hypotension. To find out whether it's sympathetic or parasympathetic, sympathetic, we, we find, we see whether there's a blood pressure, expected blood pressure changes according to the changes in posture or, or respiration. If that is not there or valsalva, so blood pressure changes corresponds more to sympathetic dysfunction. If blood pressure changes aren't there, that means it's a sympathetic uh, uh, dysfunction. If the heart rate changes, Expected heart rate changes are there according to the uh, accepted um, manual. Heart rate variability, if it is not there, it is a parasympathetic dysfunction. So generally, sympathetic and parasympathetic, they opposite, they work in an opposite manner. But there are a few conditions like ptosis. Sympathetic gets affected, the tarsal muscles get affected, there can be ptosis. 
leave it triple public superior third no parasympathetic effect they can have process sometimes they can uh, they can have the same manifest sometimes sympathetic and parasympathetic can get affected together like cavernous sinus syndrome where the sympathetic plexus of the carotid artery gets affected the third no gets affected they can have parasympathetic and sympathetic getting affected together but by and large uh, if sympathetic and parasympathetic they work in an opposite manner so postural hypotension bp heart rate changes these three i i suggest are very important uh, concepts when we are trying to evaluate an autonomic nervous system affected patient thank you sir uh, the third question will be uh, dr sampath was asking to again uh, brief about birds mnemonics birds are uh, very interesting birds always remember birds this is for c5 radiculopathy c5 innervated muscles b i r d s b is for biceps i is for infraspinatus r is for rhomboids d is for deltoid s for supraspinatus so the c5 innervated muscles are the are the birds so if c5 gets affected biceps infraspinatus rhomboid deltoid and supraspinatus gets affected so when you make acronyms it becomes easier especially when you are approaching uh, myotomes or dermatomes and uh, try to make rules like rule of 17 and rule of 4 rule of four you can talk all the cranial nerves which are present in the brain stem which are placed medially which are placed laterally all the structures which start with the letter m are placed medially all the structures which start letter the letter s are placed sideways rule of 17 10 plus 7 the movement is towards the healthier side 12 plus 5 17 the rule is the movement is towards this side so if you make such rules such acronyms it becomes easier to remember in fact uh, yeah, if dr kishan rao so gives me permission i am planning to make a video on memory improvement techniques the various types of memory and memory improvement techniques the loss of memory in my next class sir uh, we have one more question from dr prabhu sir uh, he is asking whether muscle reflexes and deep tendon reflexes are same or different Yeah, deep tendon. We we said deep tendon reflexes same biceps, triceps, supinator, knee. Yeah. yeah, one important point I would like to say is the jaw jerk, because all these are innervated by peripheral nerves. All the other reflexes, the one reflexes which is innervated by cranial nerve is jaw jerk. Afferent is also fifth nerve. Efferent is also fifth nerve. Why jaw jerk becomes important? Because with other cranial nerves, you cannot differentiate whether it is a pseudo bulbar palsy or bulbar palsy. Bulb means medial oblongata, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Pseudo bulbar means it it is like bulb, but it is not actually bulb. Pseudo bulbar means it mimics bulb. So if you want to know the whether the lesion is nine, ten, eleven, twelve, medial oblongata per se is affected, or both the corticospinal tracts supplying the nine, ten, eleven, twelve cranial nerves are affected, which is called a pseudo bulbar palsy. Very difficult to make it out clinically because the manifestations will be like nine, ten, eleven, twelve manifestations only. The only way to differentiate the best way to differentiate is by jaw jerk. When we try to elicit jaw jerk, and if the jaw jerk is brisk, that means it's a UMN type of fifth nerve. That means the lesion is above pons. That means it is a pseudo bulbar palsy. Whereas the jaw jerk is just present or absent, it is a it's a lesion is below fifth nerve. That means it is bulbar palsy. So there it becomes very important jaw jerk because it's the only reflex deep tendon reflex which is subsided by cranial nerve. Other other reflexes are subsided by peripheral nerve, and jaw jerk becomes very important when you want to differentiate between pseudo bulbar palsy and bulbar palsy. so thank you sir uh, uh, yeah. uh, that's it sir thank you so much for this wonderful session sir uh, we'll conclude the session for today sir thank you sir thank you thank you lalit and thank you vitamin for the wonderful opportunity thank you bye